I'm Dr. Olivia Scheller, Medical Director at the Institute of Medical Education and Research. Welcome to IMA Reporting Live from American Society of Hematology 2011 meeting. Today I have with me Dr. Stephen Bernstein, Professor of Medicine from the University of Rochester School of Medicine. Thank you so much for being with us today at Ash. Nice to be here. You know, there's been some exciting news that came up and our topic is Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, you know, the first question is, let's talk about this BIACOP trial. Um, right. Tell us a little bit about the trial and also how it's been um, changed a little bit to make it better for, you know, from a point of toxicity for patients. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. Um, when you look at advanced Hodgkin's disease in North America, the standard of care is a regimen called ABVD. And in Germany, the standard of care has been a regimen called Bayacop at escalated doses where it's been found to have very good efficacy, albeit when you look at all of the studies across the world, although the Bayacop regimen probably improves the progression-free survival of patients compared to ABVD, it's not clear yet that it has an overall advantage. And the difficulty with Bayacop is it's quite toxic. There's an increased risk of secondary malignancies, particularly secondary AML. Almost all patients who get treated with the escalated Bayacop unfortunately become infertile. So the question really arises, how can we maintain the excellent results with escalated Bayacop but try to decrease some of the toxicity? And that was one question that this study looked to address. The second question is the role of radiation therapy in patients with advanced stage disease. We know that radiation therapy itself is associated with long-term toxicity. And the question is, can we make decisions on who needs radiation therapy based on the results of the PET scan. So with that as a background, what this study was, was looked at patients um, were randomized to eight cycles of the escalated Bayacop regimen versus six cycles of the escalated Bayacop regimen versus eight cycles of Bayacop given on a 14-day schedule. And it was originally um, designed in a fashion whereby after patients were treated, they underwent a CAT scan for restaging, and if you had a residual mass that was two and a half centimeters or greater, you got a PET scan. If the PET scan was positive, you got radiation. If the PET scan was negative, you didn't get radiation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what the data really showed was that the overall survival advantage and disease, disease control was best in the six cycles rather than the eight cycles of escalated Bayacop, and that was due in part to a decrease in non-Hodgkin's related toxicity, cardiac tox um, not cardiac toxicity, I'm sorry, secondary malignancies in particular. So six cycles of escalated Bayacop was better than eight cycles of escalated Bayacop because it resulted, it had less toxicity associated with it. The next question that was addressed in that study, as I mentioned, is whether you can use the PET scan to determine whom would get radiation therapy. And what they found was that about 75% of the patients whom still had residual masses were PET negative, so they didn't get radiation therapy. And those that were PET positive got radiation therapy, and their outcome was actually quite good. And in the previous Hodgkin study from the German study group, which was their HD9 study, they gave radiation therapy to all patients who had a residual mass greater than two and a half centimeters because they didn't do a PET. And they wound up having to give a lot more patients radiation therapy than in this current study whereby you only gave radiation therapy to those that were PET positive, suggesting that the PET scan, if we use that as a determinant of who gets radiation therapy or not, can decrease significantly the proportion of patients who would receive radiation therapy, and that in and of itself may have an effect on decreasing toxicity. So to summarize then, it suggested that six cycles of escalated Bayacop was superior to eight cycles of escalated Bayacop because it resulted in less mortality from 
non-Hodgkin's disease related causes, number one, and number two, that the use of PET scan after treatment can help guide into who may or may not benefit from radiation therapy. So it was a very important study. And what is happening now in the states is trying to understand how to optimize the good efficacy of ABVD, the efficacy of Bayacop, the difference in the toxicity approaches by trying to understand whom are the bad actors that may need the more aggressive therapy like Bayacop. And one of the ways that's being looked at is looking at the role of PET scan. So recently there's been a number of studies to suggest that if you do a PET scan after two cycles of ABVD, if it's negative, your outcome with continued ABVD therapy is excellent. If it's positive, your outcome with continued ABVD therapy is not excellent. So the study that's being looked at as an intergroup trial is to explore the following um, scenario is if we treat patients with ABVD, the standard regimen in North America, and after two cycles we do a PET scan. If the PET is positive, we believe those patients will not have as good a result with continuing ABVD, so those patients would then go on to the escalated Bayacop regimen. So you're justifying the higher toxicity of escalated Bayacop because you think there'd be more efficacy in a group of patients who you don't think would do well with continued ABVD. In contrary, if the PET scan is negative after two cycles of therapy, you would anticipate a good outcome continuing with ABVD. So they would continue with ABVD and thus not be subjected to the higher toxicity of the escalated Bayacop. And that study is ongoing and hopefully we'll be able to determine the optimal treatment approach that could be guided in part by such prognostic um, maneuvers like PET scan so that we can have great efficacy and minimize long-term toxicity. So that was an important study. So it's actually a form of personalized medicine, if you will. Um, and I think these are excellent strategies uh, to look at in order to decrease patient uh, toxicity and increase efficacy. So that's uh, wonderful news um, at ASH this year. Right. And, you know, talking about radiation therapy, you know, what, let's talk about radiation therapy required for patients with limited stage Hodgkin's disease. Can you talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. So it, it, it's the same theme, and that's the amazing thing about Hodgkin's disease. We're at, we're at a point in treatment where our ability to cure patients is so good and what we're finding with longer term follow-up is that patients whom are cured unfortunately a proportion of them are dying from secondary toxicities of your therapy be it cardiac toxicity associated with radiation therapy solid tumors associated with radiation therapy as well as secondary leukemias and secondary AML associated with alkylating aid uh, based therapies so the whole rationale is, like before, optimize survival by optimizing your disease eradication and minimizing the toxicity. So early stage disease is a disease, um, a, the approach for early stage disease we think of somewhat differently than we do for advanced stage disease. And for a long time, Previously, the treatment of that was either radiation therapy alone or combined modality therapy. And when this study started, the hypothesis was that if we can treat patients with early stage disease with a chemotherapy alone regimen, rather than a regimen that included radiation therapy, then we would hypothesize that we would improve survival because we would decrease the secondary causes of death, i.e. cardiac and secondary solid tumors that are associated with radiation therapy. So this was a study with now 11 and a half years of follow-up that asked probably the most important question in Hodgkin's disease, what is the best treatment approach for survival? So this was a study where they took patients with early stage disease and randomized them that half got chemotherapy alone they got ABVD. After two cycles, if they were in remission, they got two more for a total of four. If they were in less than a CR, they got four more for a total of six. But one arm is chemotherapy alone. And the other arm 
is subtotal nodal radiation, which was the radiation therapy approach that was used at the time this study was conducted. And patients that had favorable prognostic factors got subtotal nodal radiation alone. Patients that had unfavorable um, prognostic factors got ABVD for two cycles and then subtotal nodal irradiation. So you essentially have one group that had a radiation-containing regimen, one group that had an ABVD-containing regimen. And again, with 11 and a half years of follow-up, what was found was the survival of patients that got ABVD was superior to the survival of patients who got a radiation-containing regimen. Now, when you looked at the um, time to progression, it was actually a little bit better in the radiation arm, but the overall survival was better in the chemotherapy arm. And the reason for that is that the non-Hodgkin's disease related mortality, again, secondary malignancies and cardiac predominantly, were less in the non-radiation arm. So that suggested at least that you can have excellent results in early stage disease with a chemotherapy alone regimen. Now, the argument is in terms of relevance for today is people will say, okay, I believe that. Your chemotherapy had better survival than your radiation group because it had less long-term toxicities. But the radiation in this study, subtotal nodal radiation, is not the radiation therapy that is given to patients in this era. So in this era, we're giving more localized radiation therapy, involved field radiation therapy. And recently, there was a very important study, also from the German Hodgkin's group, that suggested that you can have very good outcomes in patients with early stage Hodgkin's disease giving two cycles of ABVD and not subtotal nodal radiation, but involved field radiation. So the debate is still there. The argument that is given in part in the conclusion of the study that we're talking about, which was a study of the Canadian Cancer Institute and ECOG, and interestingly, this abstract as it was being presented and the embargo on its data was released, their study was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine and that was released as the meeting was on. So part of their answer to the criticism that the radiation they used is not relevant to now was the following. They said, okay, you're right. In the German study that got two cycles of ABVD, and in vial field radiation that looked real good, our data with, um, with just ABVD looked about the same. And already with only about seven years follow-up in the, in the German study group, there's already being seen some cardiac and secondary solid tumors. So the answer isn't clear, but what it does tell us that in patients with early stage disease, a chemotherapy alone regimen without radiation is still an effective and a reasonable approach. Now, because we're using PET scans more to help guide what we do, a similar study or a similar rationale that I described for advanced stage disease where studies are ongoing to use the PET scan as a way of helping guide therapy. And just like you say, it really is a personalized medicine. You're basing your therapy on how that particular patient is doing. What studies are doing now is giving, for example, ABVD alone, one study that's being conducted now in the cooperative groups. You give two cycles of ABVD alone, you do a PET scan. If the PET is negative, you can just look at giving a few more cycles of ABVD and no radiation, kind of mimicking, mimicking what this Canadian study showed that selected patients chemotherapy alone is good. If the PET is positive after two cycles, again, that suggests potentially a poorer risk group where you may then be justified in giving a therapy with higher toxicity, and those patients move on to escalated Bayacop and involved field radiation therapy.
So to kind of summarize that, this data tells us when we look at survival that with appropriate patients with early stage disease, that chemotherapy alone is a reasonable treatment approach for selected patients. And it has, in this study, improved survival over subtotal nodal radiation, not because it has better control of the Hodgkin's disease. It has excellent control of the Hodgkin's disease, but because there's less patients dying from long-term complications of the radiation therapy. So this was a very important trial. Again, with the theme of how can we optimize treatment for Hodgkin's disease, whereby we keep the great cure rates we have, but we decrease the incidence of patients dying from the complications of our therapy. Let's talk about the microenvironment. It's a very interesting place to look at. And here at ASH, it seems that if you look at the number of macrophages in the microenvironment, that maybe this has some prognostic um, value. Can you tell us a little bit about those trials? Yeah, this is really a very important area, not only in lymphoma, but in cancer in general. When you look at a tumor, those tumor cells are not sitting there in just a clump of tumor cells. They're sitting there with other immune cells, with blood vessels, with stromal cells. And there's a yin and yang. These tumor cells are interacting with the microenvironment. And in fact, in Hodgkin's disease, the malignant cell is the so-called Reed Sternberg cell. But when you look at a biopsy specimen from a Hodgkin's disease lymph node, you only see a few Reed Sternberg cells. All the rest are other immune cells, inflammatory cells. And what a group from British Columbia showed in a number of years ago was that if you look at the macrophages and you score the number of macrophages, that that has prognostic significance so that if you have a patient whose biopsy shows a high number of macrophages, those patients with therapy actually have a worse outcome than patients whose biopsy specimen shows a small number of macrophages. So the same group conducted more detailed studies trying to understand that that they presented at ASH. And what they did was they looked at gene expression profiling of biopsies of patients who had good responses to therapy and patients who had bad responses to therapy. And one of the differences in the gene expression in these two groups was the groups that had a bad outcome to treatment had a higher level of expression of various genes that are related to macrophage biology. And one of these was the receptor for a cytokine that normally stimulates macrophages, that being macrophage um, uh, stimulating factor or colony stimulating factor one receptor. And what was interesting is this receptor is normally on macrophages, but what they found, as others have, is that the Reed Sternberg cells, the malignant cell of Hodgkin's disease, actually has aberrant expression of certain proteins that are of a different lineage, so that this receptor, CSF1 receptor, normally on macrophages, was actually on the Reed Sternberg cells. And what they found was if you look at the degree of cells that express this CSF1 receptor and you combine that by looking at the number of macrophages, you had a very strong prognostic model so that patients who had high levels of this CSF1 receptor and high levels of macrophages in their biopsies had a worse prognosis than patients who didn't. But Yes, it is prognostic, but what I think is more interesting by trying to, by giving us a better handle of the biology of the importance of these other cells in the microenvironment suggests that when we learn how they interact, that may be a very important new target for treatment so that we can interrupt the interactions of the immune cells like macrophages with the tumors, if we can interrupt or modulate their interaction, that may be new ways of treating. And there's a lot of interest in trying to now not as much target just the tumor, but target the microenvironment. And this starts to give insight in Hodgkin's disease how down the line we may be able to do that. Very interesting, really a new concept in the biology. Really interesting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, brentuximab vidoitin. Can you tell us what it is and any trials that came out here at uh, American Society of Hematology on that agent and, and any efficacy on it? This is an absolutely fascinating drug, and I think it's one of the drugs that is going to make probably 
one of the largest impacts in Hodgkin's disease, at least recently. And what this is, is an antibody drug conjugate. So it's an antibody that binds to CD30, which is expressed on the malignant Hodgkin's disease cells, the Reed-Sternberg cells. And this antibody has on it a chemotherapy agent called MMAE, which targets microtubules. Microtubules are critical in mitosis for kind of pulling the chromosomes into each cell as the cell divides. So it's a microtubule poison. And it's bound to the antibody through a linker that is sensitive to enzymatic or protease digestion. Why is that important is the following. The antibody will bind to CD30 on the tumor cell. And when it binds to that protein, it gets taken into the cell. And it gets taken into the cell and then it binds to a lysosome, which is essentially a vacuole of proteolytic enzymes. It's the garbage dump of the cell. And when it's in there, the enzymes within the lysosome degrade that proteasomal linkage, now release this chemotherapy that targets microtubules into the cell, and you kill the cell. And in studies in relapsed and refractory Hodgkin's disease as a single agent, this has been shown to have about 75% response rate, which is phenomenal. So it is effective in the relapsed refractory setting. Then the question then becomes, how do we optimally use it? And this was a study done by Dr. Yunus and his colleagues that started to ask the question, all right, it's really good in relapsed refractory as a single agent. Can we move it and add it to our upfront treatments and maybe improve their outcome? So this was a dose finding study of how we can potentially combine it with ABVD or a cousin of ABVD, AVD without the bleomycin. So we're starting to get some ideas of how to be able to combine it in doses. And the preliminary data suggests, which is why it's so important to do these studies, that there seems to be a fair amount of pulmonary toxicity when you combine it with ABV, ABVD. And remember in ABVD, it's the B, the bleomycin, that even on its own has potential pulmonary toxicity. So there seems to be a concern about combining it with ABVD because of the pulmonary toxicity it may be that it will work with AVD, but then the question down the line, once this study gets completed and defines a safe dose um, that can be used in combination, the question is going to be, is it any better than ABVD alone or any of the other strategies we spoke about early? So this is a very early work, just trying to get some signal of how safely can we take this very effective agent and combine it with chemotherapy regimens that we use for upfront treatment to try to even improve the outcome of that further. Very interesting. So we have something to look forward to in Hodgkin's lymphoma, don't Definitely. we? Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here and sharing with us all the exciting news that came out here at ASH.